My name is Larissa Fontaine. I lead our global apps business. And we have a fantastic group of Googlers up here today to talk about experiences across new, new form factors. I know we've referenced Wear and Android TV and tablets throughout the day. This is an opportunity to go a little deeper on each of those and also open it up to questions from the group. So please uh, feel free to come forward. Really, at any point in time, we'll probably start with a few questions to the panel and, and hopefully have a really great dialogue. Uh, I know it's a long day, so hopefully uh, loosening up a bit. We don't have any slides for this discussion will be helpful and uh, looking forward to a great conversation. So I'll let the panelists introduce themselves as well as the areas that they'll be focusing on today. They're expert in many, but we've sort of assigned topics to the group. Hi, I'm Ellie Powers. I'm the lead product manager for apps on Google Play. And, and Ellie can talk about anything. Um, and I'm Hoy Lamf. Uh, I'm a developer advocate on Android Wear. Hi, I'm Dan Galpin. I'm a developer advocate for uh, Android TV as well as games. I'm Svika Barnholtz, and I work with partners in the Middle East and Africa, uh, apps and games. Excellent. And focusing some of your comments focusing on tablets. On tablets Great. Today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, again, we've referenced some of these new form factors throughout the day. I think some of the biggest questions we all have are what are the right types of apps? for these different experiences? And how do you think about those? What are the decisions that you need to make to determine whether it's worth the investment to build for Android Wear or Android TV or tablets or any of these exciting opportunities coming up? So I wanted to pose that question to each of the panelists, as well as ask what their favorite examples are of apps that have been developed for each of these new platforms. Why don't we start with Zvika? Yeah, my favorite example. So tablets are about there's more space, you're laid back, maybe you're at home, you have more time, you're twice as engaged, you spend twice as more money. Um, so the best examples are about content that you can actually lay out. So if you, if you look at like, um, I, I look at e-commerce apps, um, and uh, instead of just showing you one card, one product in a tablet, you can show a nice gallery of a few different things, and you can put in, the user has more um, things to look at, more likely to find what they need really quickly, and also a, a much more rich experience. And um, there was a, um, I mentioned earlier today about uh, tablets not being big phones, and I always tell people when, when my developers, they start this journey of becoming really excellent on tablets, I always tell them to turn them around. Because it's really in landscape mode that you really begin to see that with a tablet, you don't have to push away the navigation. It can be front and center. And there's still plenty of space um, to show all of the user's data. And if it's an empty state, then you can show uh, whatever is the most relevant. There's guidelines for that. Uh, but the idea is with a tablet is, I look at it as an Israeli sometimes. I paid for 10 inches. Why are you only <laughs> showing me five? Uh, but the real way to look at it is it's an opportunity for you to put front and center the great content that you have for the user on the beautiful high resolution screen that they bought. Do you have an example of a favorite tablet app experience? Um, I have so many. Um, so I mentioned e-commerce. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at uh, those kinds of apps, um, I'm, I work in Turkey, in, in Israel, and there's a few very, very good. Uh, Sahibin is a good example in Turkey. Um, there's also, in addition, if you look at um, the great uh, content apps. So um, when I started work on this team, the first thing I did is I went to the editor's choice category to look at the best of the best. And if you look at the big news apps, like uh, BBC and those ones. Um, so it's good examples. All right, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Android TV here. And uh, you know, to me, uh, what makes a great television app is that, one, it's a great consumption experience. And you know, people are getting in front of their TVs to do a lot of things they've already done. They're going to consume content. Uh, for, so for me, uh, you know, and this is going to be a little bit of a cop-out, I admit it, my, my, my current favorite app for consuming content is actually Google Play Movies. And the reason, and I know, I know it's a cop out, but the reason why I, I say this, and I've got some, you know, thoughts about this. Um, you know, one is that it's not just about getting to content quickly, but that's a, that's a huge part of it. It's being able to find the content quickly and engage with it right away. But the second thing is that Google Play Movies actually has a whole bunch of things that it does for you to help you engage more deeply with content. You can actually pause, uh, pause the, the the movie find all the different people that are in the scene, uh, get information about them. So it actually makes the entire movie into a more interactive experience kind of automatically. And it's taking you know, what we've already done with TV, which is you know, watch a movie, and then say, let's take it to the next level of interactivity. Uh, now, admittedly, I also work with a lot of game developers. And I'd have to highlight 
a couple of games. Um, you know, on, on the current uh, Android TV, which of course isn't launched yet, um, we have Riptide GP2, which allows four players simultaneous access you know, to the play of the game. And, and combat. And really, about what I think about TVs and what differentiates it in, to the most for me for, from a tablet or phone experience is that ability to share the experience directly with a whole bunch of other people. And um, you know, I think we'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about this. But so in terms of games, that's sort of, that's sort of the one that I think has, has, uh, is the most compelling for me. Um, so not only can you play with four players on the TV if they're in the room, but you'd actually use real-time multiplayer with play games to actually challenge people that are on other TVs in other living rooms. So with uh, Android and wearables in general, um, it's a little bit different compared to you know, the two form factors that, that were just heard uh, around tablet and TV. Um, with the wearables, it's all about micro interactions. So think about the very high value um, interactions that the user uh, can, can do on your app. They get in, they get it done, and they come out. And that's, that's kind of the, the model that we're, that we're aiming for for wearables. Uh, I saw of color, what's my favorite color app. Um, I love color messaging apps, so Hangout is one, WhatsApp is another one, whereby if I receive a message saying, Hoi, where are you? We are here waiting for you. I can just swipe across, tap a button and say, I'll be, I'll be there in five, sorry I'm late. And, and just dictate that very, very short message and then get back to them and come out and then continue running to, towards that meeting room. Uh, that, that's, for me, you know, one, of the, one of the best experiences I have on, on wearables. Um, so I guess we'll talk a little bit about all of the different experiences. Um, so for me, it's sort of about the context uh, and understanding what are the apps that I like the most and then seeing how they get expressed in different ways. So I have probably the biggest assortment of all my apps on my phone. Um, and the, thing, the ways that these other devices kind of come into my world is they delight me when I'm doing something that's more specialized. So like for example, if I'm having a lazy Sunday morning and I'm sitting around in bed and I just kind of wanna zone out, I'll pick up my tablet, which I keep on the table right next to me, and I'll you know, start flipping through news apps and Pinterest and other things like that, just kind of seeing what's going around and having a lazy morning. And so it can be the way that you take advantage of the different ways and the different times when someone can be using an app there. So you know, if a person is uh, on the phone, they may or may not have a lot of time to kill, but if they're sitting down with a tablet, maybe they wanna really get involved, enjoy larger images, and you know, maybe even do some little projects like, you know, well, if I lived in uh, Mexico, in the desert, what kind of cool house would I wanna have? And uh, let's see if I can dream about that for five minutes before I realize that I don't live in the desert in Mexico. And then I guess for where, for me, uh, my experience of having that device has been more about how do I uh, not miss the things I'm supposed to see that I normally miss because my phone's in my bag or in my pocket or sitting next to me and I'm not looking at it. So for me as a busy product manager, it's about my calendar notifications. You're already late for this meeting. Here's where you need to go. And that's super helpful. So I could see for any type of app that helps the user kind of manage their day, or like Hoi was mentioning, hey, someone's calling you. Normally you miss these calls, but now that it's on your wrist, you're actually answering them. So that's been one of the biggest benefits of the people who try to call me on the phone these days. Um, and then on TV, my favorite thing to do on TV is to watch TV. And uh, I think there's a huge amount of benefit from having a great experience where you can browse and find high quality experiences that just say, entertain me. So um, I've been really excited to see different media apps coming onto our TV platform. And so you can just sit there, find the show you wanna watch, and bam, you're being entertained in just a few seconds. Great, thank you. Uh, I know I'm the moderator, so I'm not necessarily supposed to answer the questions, but I wanted to share another tablet app experience that I've, I've had lately that was really phenomenal, and that's Expedia. So if you guys haven't seen it, it's a, a new experience they've launched that really changes uh, the paradigm for what you think of when you think of Expedia. I think historically, very transactional in nature. I have a trip, I know I wanna go take that, I'm gonna go book a ticket. And realizing, sort of to Zvika's point, that a tablet is much more of a consumption app more of a sort of explore and, and enjoy versus purely transactional. Uh, they've really leaned into the idea of helping you daydream a bit and think about places you'd like to explore and save ideas for later and sort of build out that dream trip 
and put together sort of you know from end to end where you might want to go, what the flight could be, and sort of matching it up with hotel and, and other sort of tourist destinations and experiences. And that was something that I think they really identified as an opportunity that was unique to the tablet form factor, that was differentiating from on your phone, you're sort of on the go, you're probably not going to sit back and have that discovery experience. And they created that on a tablet uh, that was really powerful. So that's just one more example. So on a more tactical note, I wanted to ask, probably really focusing on, on Dan and Hoy here, uh, I think a lot of developers often ask, well, how do I actually build apps for these new platforms? Is it that much harder than what I've already built? How can I leverage the, the applications that I already have? And, and how much more work does it require? So I'll make a start. Um, for where there are um, two main ways that you can build apps for, uh, for Android Wear. The first one is around notifications. So um, I guess Ali mentioned this yeah. in her presentation a little bit, uh, whereby if you are already serving notification uh, on your phone, there are very easy steps to enhance that, you know, put icons, set background images, um, make them a stack, or enable things like voice reply just directly from your phone app. So you don't need, actually need to build another APK. However, you want to take it to the next level and say, hey, I want to launch the app from my watch, um, or if I wanted to uh, access to some of the sensors that's on the watch, then yes, you can build uh, a, an APK. And the way that we uh, distribute it is super easy. Uh, you package it with uh, your phone or tablet app. When the user download that, we auto automatically, um, in the background, you know, detect that, hey, here's a watch. Ship that APK uh, for the wearables over to the watch and install it um, in the background uh, for the user. So um, yeah, so that's, those are the two ways, notification and a full APK. So I mean, obviously, you know, TV you know, has standalone apps. But it turns out there's actually two ways to target our, our TV platform. Uh, one way, and, you know, and, and this is sort of the minimum stakes, is actually to build a Chromecast app. Because all, all Android TV devices are actually Chromecast capable, um, and though they, you can use the Cast protocol, and and you can do that, and and you know that's kind of the minimal, uh, the minimal stakes to be on the platform. Uh, on the other hand, you know what we really like about TV is that not just it allows you to view content, but it also allows you to browse content in this inter interactive way. And you know TV is this huge screen that's in front of you know the, the entire group of people that's there, and it's really cool to be able to get them involved in browsing content as well. So, uh, so obviously, you know, we're, we're encouraging people to actually go and create great browse experiences as well on Android TV. And to do that, you actually end up uh, using a whole new set of APIs that we have uh, for, that allow you to very, very easily build these experiences. So both um, all, all of the apps that you see on Android TV have a couple of things in common. Um, they have these new scrolling uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, panel views. And these are all provided using the support library. And so this library is, you know, again, with the same exact Android development tools. Um, what you're really doing is replacing a couple of layouts. Um, you're changing things that are using a content provider going into a list view. You're now going to be funneling those same things into one of these new views. And it allows you to build this kind of 10-foot experience really, really easily. And uh, you know, we're talking about uh, you know, some of our developers, we literally hand them these tools. You know, three, four days later, they come back with a beautiful looking app. And uh, once you already have uh, you know, built something like a tab tablet app on Android, it's actually very, very easy to go and, and build a TV experience that looks really great and really integrates well with the platform. And you can even build it an app that actually is very smart. So we actually support something like so called UI mode. Um, we've done this for a long time. It's actually intended originally for docking. So um, most people don't know this, but you can actually change your app when it goes into a dock, and you can actually make it have uh, a different experience. We can do that on TV as well. So, um, you kind of, so we actually support UI mode television. You can detect that. And you can say, oh, well, now I'm in UI mode television. I want to make sure I'm displaying a 10-foot experience. And you can imagine a tablet that gets plugged into HDMI may even want to have that kind of experience going forward. So um, it, it's very helpful, actually, to keep the same package and the same APK, if at all possible, because you can imagine this future where, hey, we've plugged in a tablet into, into, into a television, and we want to have this beautiful 10-foot experience, very, very similar to what you get when you're actually building an app on the Android TV platform. What? Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. By definition, it doesn't have to include a camera. So um, there's there's nothing that prevents a partner from shipping a device um, that that works with a camera. But um, but but by definition, it doesn't have one. Great. So one thing that was touched on earlier, I think uh, this morning the question was asked around monetization models for these platforms. And both Michael and Ellie reference you know, the idea that 
truly today, the, the Wear devices are companion apps to phones, and we shouldn't necessarily think of them as standalone solutions from a monetization standpoint. Wanted to open it up to the panel to offer a little bit more color there for each of the platforms and, and how we think about monetization models and how that might differ from traditional mobile experiences. Uh, all right, so um, I have the easiest job because the tablets are not the emerging platform, it's already emerged. And um, what you might want to think about is, first of all, where he mentioned before, the forms of payment, the direct carrier billing. Um, you want to look at the users that are on tablets and you want to remember um, their ability to engage more, their ability to spend more time, and you want to tailor um, what the monetization is to what the value is um, perceived. And obviously, we mentioned before about subscriptions, um, because tablets are so good about consuming content and content is so good with subscription models, then a lot of the examples of success that we're seeing are based around um, people identifying content that they love, that they want to consume on a regular basis, and building a subscription based on that. You know, t TV's a little bit a little bit different than we have today in Android, although you know, I think the basic monetization models will all work. I think you can certainly do ad-based monetization. You can do freemium, you can do premium, you can do premium kinds of monetization. But I think that the platform itself is going to um, shift a little bit more towards um, sort of capped monetization. Because you think about a television device, it's often shared with a lot of people in the house. Um, maybe they're all sharing the same account. And you want to make sure they're all getting value out of that. And, and so I think that you know, subscriptions are particularly interesting when you get into the television space. Um, you don't want to have to prompt the user and take them out of the experience. It's really great if they can actually you know, have, have, have that very seamless experience. Um, when you think of ads, it really changes things as well. So you think you know, in, in, on, on a TV device, the last thing you want to do is be, is be directed to a web browser, um, which is you know, going to be you know, most likely a less than great experience. It's most likely not going to lead to a conversion. So you know, when you think about ads on TV, you're thinking about things like pre-roll ads, more like you see when you're using something like YouTube um, than when you're actually uh, you know, going and viewing a traditional mobile app. So that changes that around a little bit more. And then I think true premium experiences are also interesting. You know, I think that I think a lot of people are in the model of I rent something on my TV or I buy something, I buy something a piece of content that I use with my TV. Uh, and I think, I think that, um, you know, that just having that finality, all right, I paid this amount of money, I now am free to let my kids or my family or anyone else who's on the TV go and use it, um, is going to be a little bit more of a comforting experience. So we think there's going to be a little bit of a shift back towards even premium apps. But certainly, you know, a lot of the premium models work well as well. Yeah, so with Android, I think um, we are really right at the start of this journey. Um, so I can talk a little bit about, you know, maybe the three business models that I can uh, I, I, I can think of. The first one is ads, second one is around um, uh, kind of commerce, and then, the, um, and, then the, uh, and then the third one maybe around premium kind of model. Um, so the first one, ads, I would kind of defer to you guys. If you guys got a great idea, we are all ears on, on that one. Um, because the, 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 screen, you know, the screen real estate is so small and because you are, it is such a personal device, then um, you know, advertising would really need to be uh, quite careful, but I can imagine you know things like highly, highly targeted and user opt-in, uh, kind of geolocation-related offers, you know, could potentially work. But that will really need to be uh, you know very highly targeted. So that's kind of one way uh, we're still kind of experimenting with that. Um, the second is around kind of having a premium versions of your app, and here because again the form factor itself is so new that I would. Uh, recommend that you know maybe you, you you would have a very long trial period for the user um, at, at the very least to just let them try you know how your apps will be uh, more useful on wearables and then after you know I don't know three three months six months you say hey if you want to keep using you know this function that you really value then please subscribe to the premium version um, so you know really try to get the give the user that experience um, it's new it's, to, it's new to a lot of people. Um, so I will recommend you doing that. And then the final thing is about commerce. So the thing not to do is to say, hey, you know, why don't you browse through a thousand items and then you know, have a look at the one that you like. Uh, but instead, you know, if, you, if the user has already shown an interest on an item, and let's say you are the world's biggest bidding site, then um, you know, if the prices change, and, and you know, it's one tap away and say, hey, I will increase that bid by a pound or five pounds. That's something that you know maybe the user will value, and that's uh, that's I think 
how one of the one of the ways that um, you know this uh, form factor can be used. But I would stress that you know right back to the beginning of you know uh, my answer, this is still a very early uh, kind of form factor, and we are right at the beginning of that journey. Um, so I would encourage you to to experiment and you know to really look at the analytics and and the feedback from the users to kind of drive this platform to the next level. I guess I'll just briefly say that on the product side, we're watching this, uh, all these new developments with a lot of interest. You know, um, if I think back to apps five years ago, you know, they barely existed. There were like paid apps and free apps, and then maybe advertising got started, and now we have in-app purchases and freemium and paid apps and premium and subscriptions and all these other things. So I don't really know what's going to happen. Um, but we're just going to be continuing to watch and to see. And so, like Hoy said, I would definitely recommend that you all experiment, see what's working and what's not working. Um, and then Google Play is going to try to sort of see what's working and see how we can help encourage and grow uh, the models that seem to work for users and for developers and potentially advertisers. So I guess good luck and just let us know if you start to see any emerging trends and we'll be looking as well. Yeah, I think the feedback point there is really important. Uh, we do want this to be a dialogue, and to the extent you guys have additional ideas, these are really new, exciting areas, and great ideas are going to come from folks outside of the people on this stage as well. So I want to make sure we have time to open it up for questions. I know these are interesting topics. I also wanted to invite Brahim back up on stage, because we didn't have a Q&A opportunity with him after his presentation earlier. I think he can stay out in the hall, but um, we can start with this group. If folks want to ask questions, yeah, please go ahead. Oh, we actually do have a mic, sorry. <laughs> Hi, guys. I have a couple of questions uh, about uh, TV. So um, as, as far as I remember, this is the second time when Google enters with space. So it was a try several years ago. So what's different now uh, and what Google mo wants to make it better? I mean, I mean, there are millions of smart TVs being sold right now already. So what's going to be the difference? Why Google? and how Google wants to make it better and different, right? So it's a more broad question and a, and a very specific question. If um, will app on TV will have an ability to control channels? So I think, I mean, I think there's a, a number of things that we've done strategically differently in, in the platform. I think that, you know, uh, that Google TV actually had a lot of great things in the product, and we brought some of the best ideas and some of the best features of Google TV into Android TV. So I, and in fact, it turns out that anyone who's written an app for Google TV version 4, I'm uh, sorry, for Android TV can easily take that app and actually run it on Google TV version 4. That's, what, that's the way it's actually been designed. Um, but I think, that, I think the real difference is that, one, we've built some really great tools to actually help people build consistent user experiences. We've really thought that through in a very different way than we did with the original uh, Google TV product. Um, the second thing is we've actually reduced the platform requirements in terms of, of what experience we're actually, we're actually forcing. In, in, in the Google TV model, um, we really thought of, of the product as being an adjunct to your cable or your dish or whatever kind of, kind of subscription you had. And really, it was, about, it was about trying to add value to that, that thing you were getting off of the air. And you know, the Android TV really recognizes the fact that we are in a model where people are streaming an enormous amount of content. And we want to make that experience really, really rich and wonderful. But I think, I think from, you know, from uh, the actual technical side of things, what we've done is we've made sure that, that Android TV and all the stuff that we're doing with TV is really just a, a larger part of the entire Android solution. So um, not only are the same teams developing both platforms, and, but they're also remaining lockstep in with the regular Android platform with all the same APIs. Um, we're having support for the NDK right from the start. We're having support for things like controllers. And those applications are really easy to bring across from one to another. And we have the cloud backend now tied into it to make it very, very easy to move content and move experiences seamlessly from one to the other. Like, just a lot of things weren't ready when we had Google TV uh, launched. And I think that we, you know, we took some of the best ideas from that platform and all of the things we've built since then and brought them into, into what we've done in Android TV. Hi, sorry, I'm not sure uh, to how many people this is relevant, but uh, if you're working on a situation, I, I have a situation where I have a pretty mature, well-developed web app or set of web apps, um, and I also have tablet apps, but the tablet apps kind of lag behind the web. And one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately is what your view is on the future. Like, in the future, do you think that the PC is dead and that basically anything 
that people are using a PC for now will inevitably be done on a tablet, and therefore the need to have a very kind of power user tablet app for a parallel web app is super important and kind of urgent. And, and if you have that view, when? Like, you think it's three years away, five years away? Does anybody want to take that? Yeah, okay. I will refer you, if we refer you to a slide we saw before about material design. I don't know if you noticed, but there was a laptop computer and a tablet uh, and a phone. I don't think any form factor is going away. We're seeing incredible traction with tablets, obviously phones. Um, and I would, with a problem like yours, with a situation like that, you have to sort of rethink what the brand identity is, what the important colors are, what the user experience is. The interaction design comes first. And then the detailed native design on every platform and how it looks like. And it should be easily identifiable. Users should always know I'm in my heritage now because this is the icon, this is the color, and the information is just laid out automatically. It's the same information, it's the same family yeah, that, tree. Yeah, for sure, I mean, that part, 100%. I guess I'm wondering, in terms of just pure functionality, if we're building towards an inevitable future in which anything that people are doing now on the web will be done at some point exclusively on the tablet app or the tablet browser, and that the PC eventually will just become, and if Google has a position on that, or if it's not really relevant and kind of abstract. Oh, well. We're not calling out any winners on that, but I don't think, I, I try to look at the foreseeable future, say a few months from now, and nothing is going away. Um, so I'm not gonna be able to help you reassign your web guys to other teams. <laughs> um, you are going to have to support these things, and especially with um, all the traffic that I know that you have on web, it's just a question of that identity. Um, it, it has to be on all of the above. I know everyone wants to focus, but on this particular area, uh, you need to be that uniform experience. Yeah, I think on, on, on this particular topic, I think we're going to see a lot of a lot of conversion going. I mean, you know, going on. I think that, that you know we're we're seeing the ability on the latest version of Chrome OS to actually run certain Android apps. Um, so we are seeing that these platforms are getting closer together. Um, but I, and I think we're going to see content creation coming from both. Uh, but I, I don't see the web going away. I think you know, you know, Google certainly has an enormous commitment to to our web applications, and and, uh, and you know, if, if it makes sense for your consumers, um, then then you should have them. Sure. Hey there, uh, Duncan from FDB Pro. So I've got two quick questions uh, for Dan. Uh, question number one: Can you give us a rough idea what sort of numbers uh, you're looking at in terms of, you know, shipments, households, etc., for uh, Android TV? And then question number two: um, What do you think are the really exciting opportunities now for when we were a content app? So, versus, uh, you know, smartphone, tablet. What are the opportunities, you know, for video, etc., which you think are really exciting, which the new platform allows? Sure. So as far as numbers, I mean, we work with a lot of OEMs, uh, and so I can't. Possibly, I don't even know, but I can't even possibly disclose them, even if I did. Uh, you know, the, and, and, the, and the truth is, you know, the Android TV is, is going to be a platform that a whole bunch of different people are going to ship. Uh, you know, a bunch of the devices are in the pipeline. A lot of the, the major brands that we're talking to are announced uh, publicly at Google I.O. this year. And so we're seeing both, you know, s both set-top boxes, OTT boxes, um, actual TVs, um, cable providers, all, all of these companies are coming together and building t Android TV devices. And that's really exciting. I mean, that's, you know, and I, and I think, you know, I'm not worried about devices getting out there. I'm, 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 I'm worried about great content experiences. And so to me, what's, what's exciting about TV by comparison to tablet is kind of what I was talking about before in that we have the ability to do all of these really, really cool interactive experiences. You know, you know the example that I, that I gave earlier was, you know, on a tablet, you might have a, an app that allows you to order pizza. And you know, you could put that onto a TV and you know, people might use it to order pizza. But wouldn't it be really cool if what you really had was a second screen experience? So you had 20 people in the room and you're trying to order pizza for 20 people and everyone is, is submitting all of their, you know, their requests and you're seeing it all go up on the screen as these are the pizzas that you're actually gonna end up ordering and it becomes this interactive experience with everyone. And I see the same thing with, with, with video as well. You know, people should be able to help build playlists um, select the kinds of videos they're interested in. And you can imagine groups working together with these really awesome sort of second screen experiences. And so, so to me, that's, that's what makes it a, that's what differentiates it, you know, from a platform to what you'd be building on a tablet. I think those single user experiences are really important to get right, don't get me wrong. But I think you can build these really, really cool experiences that work great in the living room for large numbers of people. Hi. 
Um, I'm Polly, I'm from gumtree.com, and uh, I just had a question about um, wear. Um, so I've used the watch for a little bit. Um, I'm not wearing it now. Um, and so there were two things that stood out to me that were interesting from a user experience. Um, so one is that I like going running, and um, it's really great to be able to go running with the, with the watch um, and track your activity, but you have to take the phone with you, which is kind of difficult. And the other one is, the reason why I'm not wearing the watch now is that I'm quite busy. I get lots of emails and notifications anyway, and actually it was like information overload. So I wondered whether you had um, you know, any ideas for improving those things in the pipeline, uh, because those are the kind of pain points that I experienced. Um, so I think a, a couple of weeks ago, we, um, uh, we, we announced that we will have a lot more kind of offline functionality coming, coming along. Um, to, to answer your kind of first part of your question. So uh, things like, you know, offline music, um, you know, GPS support, those are coming uh, for, uh, for, for Android Wear. Um, as for the second part, you know, regarding notifications and sometimes overloading, um, we're acutely aware of that. And um, that's why in the companion app, we offer the user to switch off notifications from certain apps. And in our internal testing before Android Wear comes out, actually that's a lot what we focus on and, and I guess, that's something that um, maybe is really helpful, you know, when you're developing your apps. Um, going back to kind of early style deck earlier around that UX iteration, you know, hey, if you send three types of notification, which ones do people find really annoying? Let's switch those off. Which one do people find, hey, this is really value add? I, I absolutely wanted this. Um, then, uh, yeah, I think those kind of um, UX reiteration uh, will be will be really helpful in building meaningful notifications. 